One of my students asked me if I'd seen the news article about the crazy difficult HSC maths exam question from last week. So of course I'm curious, what is this question? What's so hard about this question? For some context, in Australia, the curriculum varies by state. HSC is what they take in Sydney, New South Wales. I teach in Melbourne, Victoria. Of course, there's differences, but a lot of the content in the hardest math subject is comparable. Before we dive in, it's probably worth me saying that I searched up for this question and what I found first was a video by Mind Your Decisions, fantastic maths channel, Presh Tile Worker did a video on this exact problem. I then found another video by a current year 12 student who just sat the exam explaining her solution, also a very good video. But I think I can explain it in a way that's a little bit simpler. Of course, I'm biased, but you can be the judge. And I also have some comments at the end about wording of the problem and perhaps some ambiguity in the wording that could have been avoided and may have confused some students. All right, let's get into it. So the complex numbers W and Z both have modulus one and arg of Z over W is between pi on two and pi, where arg denotes the principal argument. All pretty reasonable so far, but this is where it gets a bit wacky. For real numbers x and y, consider the complex number xz plus yw over z. On an xy plane, clearly sketch the region that contains all points xy for which arg xz plus yw over z is between pi on 2 and pi. So if we start from what information we do know about z and w's, they both have modulus 1, so they're both going to lie somewhere on this circle of radius 1 centred at the origin. And the argument of z over w is between pi on 2 and pi, which means the complex number z over w must lie somewhere in this quadrant of the circle. In fact, position of z over w as a complex number is going to be more important than the actual position of z or w individually. And we'll see why in a minute, because when we take this expression x, z plus y, w over z, and simplify by dividing that first term through by z, we'll get x plus y times w over z. Now, w over z is of course the reciprocal of z over w. And we know that the modulus of z over w is 1, so the reciprocal is going to have the same modulus, modulus of 1. And all that's going to happen is the angle is going to be reversed. So if the original angle was theta, the angle of the reciprocal will be negative theta. Okay, so we knew that z over w was in quadrant 2 up here with a modulus of 1 and an angle somewhere between pi and 2 and pi. Having reversed that angle now to between negative pi and negative pi on 2, w over z will be on this arc of the circle down in quadrant 3. Again, the modulus is 1, that has not changed. Knowing the position of w over z, we're well on our way to being able to solve this problem. And that's what I meant earlier when I said that we don't really need to know anything about z or w individually. What matters is the position of z over w because that tells us the position in this case of the reciprocal w over z. And when we multiply w over z by y and then add x, we need to have a complex number that has an argument between pi on 2 and pi. So it would land somewhere in this quadrant here. We no longer care about the modulus of this complex number. All we care about is that the angle should be between pi on 2 and pi. Now x and y here are real numbers. So we're taking our complex number w over z, we're multiplying it by some real number y, and then we're adding some real number x. To understand the effect of this, it probably helps to start with the addition first. So by adding a real number, what would happen to a point on the complex plane? Well, it can only move to the left and right, okay? Because real numbers uh, occur along the x axis, we add a positive real number, we will translate to the right. If we add a negative real number, we will translate to the left. What about multiplication by a real number? Well, if that real number is positive, it's just going to change the modulus of the complex number. So if, if y were 2, for example, and if I were to take any point along this arc here and double it, it would be moving further away from the origin. But then by only moving left or right, by adding x, which is moving left or right, how could I end up up here in a second quadrant? Uh, I could not, that's not going to be possible. So the only option is that y is actually going to be a negative multiplication. And if that's the case, not only can I change the modulus, but I also reflect my point in the origin and I will ref be reflecting back up to the first quadrant up here. So if y were negative two, for example, uh, this point multiplied by negative two would be reflected up here and double the modulus. And this other point, again, double the modulus and reflected in the origin up here somewhere. So this set of points, which were in quadrant two, would be reflected to this set of points in quadrant one, uh, which also have double the modulus. In this case, this is an example where y is negative two. 
To take another example, say y is negative a half, well, this point would be still reflected, but now have half its original modulus, and this one again reflected with half its original modulus, and we can see that this arc, this set of points, would be reflected uh, to this arc up here, still in quadrant 1, but with only half the modulus. So we know that y has to be less than 0 to get us up here to quadrant 1, and then we can see that x is going to have to be less than 0 if I want to move this set of points into this second quadrant where I need to end up. As far as the size of x, well that's going to depend on where my original complex number was. So for example, if I started out here, was reflected up to this point, I would have to move to the left but not too far. Whereas if I started at this point and I was reflected way over here, then I would have to move further. My x value would need to be larger or more negative. And this is where I was quite confused, and I'm going to say it, I think it's a flaw in the question, in the way the question is stated. But before I get too far into complaining, let's just answer the question <laughs> as it's intended. And I think the intention is to find a set of values x and y that would work for any complex numbers z and w that satisfy the original conditions. Looking at this example where y is negative 2, the worst case would be if my original value of w on z was just on here, really, really close to the real axis there. Then after reflection, I'm very far over to the right, and I need to move very far back to the left. But how far? Well, remember, this length here is 2, so I would need to move 2 units to the left, meaning that x would need to be less than negative 2 to ensure that no matter which values of w and z I started with, I would always end up in the second quadrant. Similar thing with this second example, if y is negative a half, the worst case is if I end up very far over to the right here, and I would need to move uh, more than half a unit to the left. So x should be less than negative a half. And in general, then x should be less than y. Remember we said y has to be less than zero, x has to be less than zero, and now we're saying uh, y has to be greater than x, which gives us this region here, which would be the expected solution to our problem. But again, to go back to the actual wording of the problem and the ambiguity that's there, actually the values of x and y depend on the values of w and z. But we're not told what the values of w and z are, we're just told that they both have modulus 1 and they satisfy this condition with their angles. But it is going to make a difference. So for example, if w and z are complex numbers such that w on z turns out to be this point here, which has an angle of negative 3 pi on 4, then I can say for sure that this horizontal distance here is equal to the cosine of pi on 4. So x would have to be less than y times the cosine of pi on 4, which is y over root 2. But this root 2 would change depending on the position of the complex number w on z. If w on z were closer to the imaginary axis, as the angle is closer to pi on 2, the cosine becomes very close to 0, and this line would have a much steeper slope. As theta is closer to pi, then cosine theta is closer to negative 1, and the line would have a slope close to 1, as we showed in the previous solution. In the Mind Your Decisions video, and in the other ones I saw online, they've given the relationship between y and x, but also included a cos theta term in there, where theta depends on the values of z and w, which is totally correct, because it does. But then in the question, we're asked to sketch a subset of the xy plane, so it should be enough to have y in terms of x, not y in terms of x and theta, which depends on z and w. So interesting question. Do not envy the students who had to sit that in their exam. Well done for giving it a go if you did. For the rest of you, I hope you found the video useful. See ya!